We are interviewing Doug Tanner of Voorheesville, New York today, January 26, 2006, at 1.45 p.m. He served in the United States Coast Guard October 1960 through October 1964. The interviewers are June and Ken Hunter. Please tell us your full name and when and where you were born. William Douglas Tanner. I was born in Albany, New York, 19, uh, January 2nd, 1943. And what did you do before you entered the service? Uh, high school, school, and I worked on farms and worked with my uncle as a caretaker on uh, F.C. Hike, uh, Hike Estate up in Rensselaerville. Now why did you enter the Coast Guard? Because my brother said they served good food. <laughs> my brother was, my brother, I had two brothers in the Navy during the war. Um, one was on the battleship uh, North Carolina and the other one was on the destroyer USS Radford. Uh, in the Pacific, so, but my uh, one brother that was on the battleship North Carolina kept telling me, join the Coast Guard, uh, food's good and everything, so that's how I got the Coast Guard. All right. What was the basic training like at Coast Guard and where was it? Uh, well, we had two choices. They had just opened Alameda, California in Cape May, New Jersey. Cape May, New Jersey was the original. I, I don't know how long it's been the uh, uh, Coast Guard training facility, but it's been, was long before I went in. Uh, we had two choices, either Alameda, California, or Cape May, New Jersey. I went to Cape May, New Jersey. Um, it was 12 weeks. They, uh, at that time, they, they basically, didn't matter what rate or uh, like whether he was going into the engineering or deck force or uh, radio quartermaster, it, di it didn't really matter what you were going to be doing. Everybody went through the same basic training, which was basic, uh, basic seamanship, uh, boat handling. Um, you had to pay, you had to be able to swim, swim the length of the two lengths, I think it was, of a Olympic sized pool. Um, you practice jumping in the water with life jackets. Um, you also had to, you had to learn Morse code and you had to learn semaphore uh, before you could graduate from boot camp because uh, at that time uh, the Coast Guard and still today as far as I know, I don't know if they still make everybody uh, learn that, but they uh, they wanted you to know it because you could get on very small units and a lot of the units were three, four people. So you had to know, you had to know how to send and receive Morse code, how to send and receive semaphore, um, which right after I got out of boot camp because the field I went into and where I went, I promptly forgot most of that, so. Well, if you didn't know how to swim when you went in, did they teach you how to swim? They taught you, yes, mm -hmm. yep. I know in the Navy they put them through, people, the recruits through an extensive training session that includes uh, weaponry, learning how to operate, uh, how to row uh, rescue boats and then in case they had to abandon ship or so. Uh, also, how to do fire control, uh, how to handle damage control and put out fires on a ship. Is it similar in the Coast Guard? The Coast Guard, yeah. Um, in boot camp, they basically taught you how to row a, a boat. I was on a, what they call a boat crew, or they used to have races and stuff in uh, Cape May, I forget what they called that, inlet or sound there. Uh, the, Fire, the, the weapons training and stuff was done in boot camp. You, you had to qualify on a 45 and you had to qualify on an M1 at that time. Uh, as far, 
from the firefighting standpoint, they didn't really, that, that was after boot camp. Once you got out of boot camp, you went to more to those, what they called advanced training. Mm -hmm. You didn't do that in boot camp. Uh, like my company in boot camp was 50 men. And I forget how many companies were going through at the time, but you know, uh, the one thing the Coast Guard, and I think it's still the same today, New York City Police Force has more personnel than the Coast Guard does. We had 30, there was 38,000, I think, when I went in, and New York City Police Force was like, it was, we were 36,000, they were 38, and or we were 38, and they were 40,000, something in that range. I mean, so the Coast Guard was, was very selective. Uh, for the month of October that I went in, they only took two people from the Almighty Recruiting Station. So, uh, so, so once you got out of boot camp, where did you go? Uh, I was young and naive and believed a lot of things that people said and one of the things was is that if you go to Alaska, uh, you're assured of your duty station when you come back, your pick of duty stations. And the Coast Guard had some very desirable good duty stations and some very undesirable duty stations. So. Uh, I volunteered to go to Alaska, which I never regretted, uh, and I served, uh, I actually extended my stay in Alaska. I was up there for 22 months, and the stay would have normally been 18. Uh, and I went to what they call Base Ketchikan, which is down in the Panhandle in the Tungus Narrows, what they call the Tungus Narrows of Alaska. Um, and I got um, assigned to what they referred to as maintenance and repair detachment out of base Ketchikan. Uh, and I was, because I was going for damage control, man, which covers, covered uh, carpentry, welding, pipe fitting, basically all the construction trades. And, um, Base Catch Can did all the maintenance and repair work plus new construction and everything on all the lighthouses and Loran stations in in uh, Alaska from in the panhandle where you first crossed into Alaska there was tree I think it was Tree Point Lighthouse which went all the way up the, the coast and out to at two island out in the Aleutians. So during my stay in Ketchikan, I hit most of the lighthouses and Loran stations in Alaska all the way. I didn't get to at two when I was in the Coast Guard. I got there later, but uh, out to Cape Sarachev, um there's a Loran station uh, and uh, a number of lighthouses. Now, were they all manned back then? Back then, the lighthouses were manned. They had uh, four four individuals on them. Of course, it was no, uh, the Coast Guard was all male at that time. Uh, they would normally be a bosun mate in charge, probably usually it was first class bosun mate. They'd be an engine man who was the because the lighthouses were all isolated duty, they had to generate their own power and everything. So they had generator sets. They'd be uh, normally a second or a first class engine man and a fireman and a seaman. And uh, they operated 24 hours a day, seven days a week, did their own cooking and everything. Somebody was always on watch. Uh, they used to rotate through the watches. And, uh, their main thing was to do the routine maintenance and man, they they all had radios for emergency search and rescue or if a boat or something was in trouble. But uh, 
you know, their main thing was to operate the light and foghorns in that equipment. And any of the major overhauls of the generators or repair work, whether, no matter what it was, electrical, pipe fitting, mechanical, carpentry, uh, was done with what out of the base, base catch can with what they called the maintenance and repair attachment, which we usually had. It ranged, but we would be anywhere from two guys to eight or ten guys going out to a to a station to do work. It all depended on what had to be done and how much work had to be uh, completed. We erected buildings and put in new generating capacity and new generators and overhauled old ones and, you know, it was kind of, it was just a job, you know yeah. I mean? <laughs> Well, how long would these uh, men have a duty on one lighthouse? They, they nor the, the ones that were stationed on the lighthouses, they was four guys and they normally rotated every three months a new per, mm -hmm. new person would come in, you know, once a quarter. What about food supplies and all? They have to have three months worth at a time? No, they, the, uh, the, the buoy tenders and stuff that took care of the, the buoys mm -hmm. in the uh, inland, or the Tungus Narrows and all up through there, they had a pretty much a set schedule. I think it was every couple of weeks they would make make a run to the lighthouses. And uh, that's normally, we either got there, these were, again, all isolated duty. They're out in the no place up there at that time. There's only two ways in, by boat or by seaplane. And uh, when we went out, we either went out on, on one of the Coast Guard buoy tenders or one of the small boats, or sometimes they would fly us in with uh, Coast Guard seaplanes or even uh, commercial seaplanes would take us in sometimes and pick us up. Did you ever experience any unusual weather? What was it like if you did? In the Panhandle region in the coast of Alaska, you know, um, contrary to the belief of Alaska being cold and stuff, it was a lot like it is outside right now. I mean, it, the, in the winter time, <coughs> in the winter time, it would be depending upon where you were, but it would range from the mid to mid 30s to mid 40s. Um, in the summertime, it, from the mid 40s to the mid 60s, let's say. Uh, in the Panhandle region, it rained almost constantly. In Ketchikan, it's Ketchikan proper, it was uh, 17 foot of rainfall a year. So uh, it, it was it was raining all the time. I mean, your typical work gear was rain suits and rubber boots and you just went out and did whatever you had to do. I mean, it, very seldom was it, you know, in the, in July, end of June, couple of weeks in the end of June, July, and about the middle of August was the, the dry season. That was good weather where it didn't rain every day. The rest of the time it pretty much rained every day. While on, while on this kind of isolated duty, were there instances where people needed medical assistance or dental assistance? How did they handle a, a need for that? Well, the, the personnel that was assigned to the lighthouse, if they, if they had, um, if they had a, a need for that, you know, medical, dental, or something like that, or an emergency, uh, they had personnel in Ketchikan on the base that they would send out as the relief person. Um, in, you know, by air, depending upon the weather and stuff, by air, none of these stations were more than three or four hours from mm -hmm. the Coast Guard base in Ketchikan, which was, Ketchikan was the, the biggest city. Juneau, Alaska was the next biggest city. 
and then you had to go all the way up to Anchorage before you you had a decent sized city. On a ship, you have a regular crew that would do the cooking and mess cooks and what have you. How do they handle the food on there? Was it a rotational basis? Everybody took a, a turn at cooking. For the most part, like when we went out, if if we were going to have a, a fairly large crew, we would bring our own cook with us. Um, if there was only one or two of us going out to do something on the station, um, we would, everybody pitched in, usually amongst the crew, there was always somebody that liked to cook more than somebody else, so uh, it, it was pretty much, you know, you cook your own breakfast, you, and you do your own dishes and everything, uh, you cook your own lunch and everything, do your own dishes and, and normally they would be somebody that liked to cook so like dinner or something at night or they'd either eat their their big meal at night or the big meal and at noontime and they would be somebody that that liked to cook that that did that if not they they very seldom said you're the cook i mean they if somebody didn't step up and want to do it, it was everybody for themselves. I take it you weren't one of those chosen to cook too often. Well, <laughs> yeah, we used to, and I, and I cooked a couple of times at a couple of the, the stations, but our, our primary thing was to be there, you know, they gave us a time frame to get a, a certain job mm -hmm. done. We had to send progress reports back and everything mm -hmm. to where we were because they used to, you know, a lot of our schedule worked around the, 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 uh, the buoy tender of the ship coming for mm -hmm. the next supply run. A lot of times they wanted us done, ready to get onto the ship and we'd go on to another place. Mm -hmm. Like uh, the normal rotation on isolated duty was a year and, and I was there 22 months. Yeah, 22 months. And I probably spent 20 on isolated duty stations mm -hmm. because we, we just we just kept moving from one <laughs> to the other, and we'd go back to the base for a week or two, and then we'd be uh -huh. out again. So, uh, but got to see a lot of Alaska. Got some good fishing. Well, I thought maybe done, you said you saw a lot of water. <laughs> seen a lot of water, but uh, you know, got to fly around a lot uh -huh. of Alaska uh, and everything. Uh, Went to Anchorage, never got very far inland, but all along the coast, you know, now, Kodiak, Anchorage. Curious, you'd mentioned how you hadn't been on a ship before, boats. Did you have any experiences with seasickness and all that and getting used to it or bad weather? Uh, well, when, when I was ready to rotate out of Ketchikan, um, I had put in for the East Coast, which was the first Coast Guard district, which was Boston, I forget the what district New York is in, New York and in, in the Great Lakes Coast Guard districts. And uh, like I said, I had, you know, they'd said, well, you're pretty well assured of, assured of getting one of the ones that you want when you come back. And then on top of that, I had extended my my stay up there, so I thought I was going to get one of those and uh, my orders came back you know it was due to the shortage of damage control in, in the seventh coast I think it's seventh coast guard district San Francisco you know you're hereby proceeded to or hereby ordered to proceed after you leave and all that stuff <coughs> to base Alameda for Further, further assignment, which I wound up on, or ended up on the Coast Guard Cutter Gresham, which was an ocean station vessel at that time, in, uh, in search and rescue vessel. And um, no, I didn't get seasick. I uh, just when you went from assignment to assignment, from one lighthouse to another, was there a, the uh, having to put together your your sea bag and carry it with you all the time or did you just take uh, as if we were going on a short trip? 
Well, yes and no. I mean, the one thing, uh, and that was another good thing about, nice thing about the Coast Guard, was from a, a military uh, procedure standpoint and stuff, let's call it that, especially back then up in Alaska on those isolated duty stations, uh, uh, it, it was pretty, pretty lax. I mean, we were guest workers, let's put it that way, on the lighthouses. Uh, we just carried our, uh, carried work clothes and stuff with us, whatever, you know, coveralls and, and uh, dungarees and all that stuff. And, uh, and a lot of times we had tools and stuff that we had to bring with us also. Um, the only time we really got in uniform was if we were going to be transported or, yeah, transported by commercial um, carriers or something. Then, then we had to wear our uniform. But if we were being shuttled from one place to the another by the uh, by Coast Guard or Coast Guard aircraft or whatever, we just wore our normal work clothes, which were, you know, back then was chambray shirts and dungarees. And, and uh, you had a, I think it was blue baseball cap back then. You, you know, you just, so it, it was pretty, pretty low key and stuff. But if we were going to be going by commercial carrier, uh, then we had to wear our regular dress uniforms. So we took them with us, but other than that, it was just work clothes and stuff. Do they have a schedule where you put so many days uh, at a, a facility and then you were eligible to have a leave? Or Well, you got 30 days leave a year and you could take it whenever, you know. Uh, but no, I mean, you had a, again, like a normal job, you had a, put in when you were going to want to take your leave and stuff and uh, working on the, the maintenance and repair detachment out of Ketchikan uh, of course I was single there was a number of us was single and then there was some married personnel and the single guys usually got the the jobs from you know they they would take in uh, like we'd go to one place that was like Lincoln Rock, Lincoln Rock, Rock Lighthouse, which was in the half, roughly halfway from Ketchikan to Juneau or up in that way. And you know, when you went out there, you might be going out for two weeks or three weeks. When you went out, you know, your your orders, the, your transit orders or whatever would say. You're going to go out there and do this job or whatever, and it's an estimated three weeks, and then you're going to come back to the base. Well, a lot of times what would happen by the time the three weeks was up, and especially if you had a semi-certain trade or whatever, like I did a lot of welding and pipe fitting and stuff, um, by the time the three weeks was up, you would get, you know, hey, when you're done, you know, they'd send you thing that basically said, hey, when you're done with this job, you know, you're going to proceed to Sitka, you know, Coast Guard mm -hmm. Cutter such and such is going to pick you up at whatever time, take you to Sitka, you know, you mm -hmm. got, here's your airline tickets and stuff, you're flying to Kodiak to go down mm -hmm. to uh, Cape Sarachev out on the Aleutian Islands because they got a piping job or something mm -hmm. that needs done, okay. doing. So. You know, you you just kept moving around. The the married personnel that had their families up there and stuff, they tried to bring them back and then send them back out. But the, mm -hmm. the single guys mm -hmm. kind of they were there was a number of times where I would be gone from Ketchikan for a couple months, a couple three months at a time. Mm -hmm. just, you know, without getting back to catch a game. <laughs> well, I, oh. I was wondering, how far north did you get? Did you get all the way up to Barrow and all up into that? No, no not, not with the job I had. Yeah. Now, were there any 
unusual situations where rescue was required? Well, again, my the type of job that I had, typically we didn't get involved in that. The, the one time I was at the base and they, uh, I was on duty, and so we had a number. Uh, we had three 40-foot patrol boats that worked out of the base, and everybody took, uh, I won't say took turns, but you had duty sections, and if a boat got called out, uh, you'd get assigned to go out on a boat. And, and we got a, they got a call from the Ketchikan police that there was a, what they termed a floater in the in the channel there, and the floater was a dead body. And uh, <clears throat> we had to go out. I was on duty that night when we had to go out and pick pick up the floater, which uh, the uh, the boat coxswain, who was a bosun mate and stuff, and had done this a number of times. Kept telling myself and another, the other guy that was on the boat crew, don't turn them over. You know, we had a Stokes litter with the uh, with the chicken wire in them, you know, mm -hmm. which you had to dip and underneath and stuff. Mm -hmm. And he kept saying, don't turn them over, don't turn them over, you know. And the other guy was a new guy or young guy too, and you know, kind of, you know, why is he saying that? And, the body did turn a little bit when we was picking it up, and the crabs had been having a meal. Yeah, so yeah, is it worked out? I think if I remember right, and I'm not a hundred percent sure, but that they did a autopsy or whatever, they they found out who it was, but it, it was a guy that had fallen off a fishing boat someplace or something. You know? I imagine that's how most. Accidents yeah. would happen up there. It was the water must have been very cold though, even uh, if the air wasn't. The Japanese current that that's what yeah. makes that area kind of temporary or whatever, because yeah. the Japanese current is is out in the, you know, off mm -hmm. the coast right, right. there. Uh, I really don't remember what the water temperature was in in the inland, the Tonga Snarls mm -hmm. and stuff. Uh, it it never was. Because they, they weren't real wide and stuff, it never really got super rough in there. And what about the uh, hours of daylight? You have the short days in the winter. Did that affect any of your work? No. No, that that just you know we we normally worked a eight hour day. Normal day, yeah. Yeah, normal day. Typically. But in the winter time, you must have spent a lot of days in darkness or twilight, didn't you, or not? Yeah, again, we weren't Fine enough, way know. north. I mean, you know, about the furthest north would be, I'd have to look at a map again, would be Anchorage. Mm -hmm. And Anchorage gets kind of, you know, it gets dark. Earlier than Yeah, 2.30, 3 o'clock in yeah. the afternoon or whatever, and not light until 9 o'clock. Yeah. But, uh, you know, even when it was dark like that, it really didn't. Yeah, because it wasn't dark, dark. So you still can work outside it's and stuff. Like a twilight. And a lot of our stuff was inside, also. I mean, it wasn't all outside work. Mm -hmm. Did you ever have an opportunity on any any of the vessels you were on to utilize your skills in damage control, fires, or so forth? We, I was in charge of the forward damage control party on the coast on the Gresham which are the ocean station that we patrol normally was uh, ocean station November which is halfway between San Francisco and Hawaii and I don't I'm, yeah, I'm almost positive they don't have a, a ship there anymore they got a buoy there the primary purpose of that was for weather reporting and for overseas flights so there was a they used to radio beacon in on the ship, and plus, so they were out there for search and rescue. Uh, but we had a fire aboard ship uh, while we were en route to the, the ocean station. But uh, 
as it turned out, it, it was, you, you had a forward damage control party and an aft damage control party, and the fire was in the aft hawser locker, so my party didn't have to fight the fire, except everybody was nervous because, you know, it's uh, no mutual aid call or anything, you know, so, uh, but the aft damage control party took care of it and put it out and, and we all had to clean up <laughs> afterwards mm -hmm. so on board ship uh, is there a similarity like to the navy you were always uh, having continuous drills and uh, calling uh, having everybody man stations battle stations and things what yes. was it like yeah uh, in the coast guard on the ship that i was on which was the, you know, an ocean station vessel, 311 foot. Um, and, you know, we had five inch guns, 40 millimeter guns back then. Uh, and uh, they were, we did the same thing as a, as a Navy vessel would do. Uh, we used to, back then they used to have the, what they called the ABC chemical attack, uh, drills and stuff where, you know, we had to put on impervious suits and all that and go out and wash down the ship and and we had, um, you know, general quarters drills routinely when we were underway, when we were at sea. Um, it, so the the thing was, yeah, pretty, pretty much the same thing. You had, you had general muster every day after lunch. That's where they took a head count of everybody, make sure they had everybody was still aboard. Uh, and then typically, right after the general muster, they would sound the general quarters alarms, and that's when you did your drill. Uh, pretty much every day except Saturday. I don't, I don't remember. Sunday definitely was, you know, that was a down day. But uh, Saturday, I think, was also a, a drill day underway. How were meals on board ship and also for purposes of washing clothes, showering, was water limited? Water was limited. Uh, they had a lawn, we had a laundry and, and there was always, there was somebody assigned to do the the laundry, usually from the deck force and that was a rotational type thing. Um, water was was limited. Um, I won't say it was because our ship was diesel electric so uh, on, on a steamship you know the water come, goes for the boilers first but uh, on diesel electric uh, I forget what size evaporators we had but um, water was was watched, let's put it that way. They, they really didn't put a... We took sea showers, though, where they had a time, you know, you 30 seconds or whatever it was on, you wet down, then you soap off, and then a minute or whatever it was to, to rinse off. Uh, and typically, they would be somebody watching that, you know, because uh, in, you know, the food and stuff aboard ship was... Sometimes we thought it wasn't that great, but it, it, it was good food. I mean, they, they, there wasn't a problem with with food. Then, when you were in port, a lot of times, especially on Sunday, uh, it was again breakfast was essentially every man for himself. Galley it was open galley. You went and cooked your own breakfast, cleaned up your own mess. Uh, if you wanted to eat, you know, on board. So, that was, my brother was right, the, the food was, was okay. <laughs> so that was the day you'd have bacon and eggs and things good like that, or? Well, yeah, they, they would always put something in the, in the refrigerator, you know, uh, you know, they, of course, bacon was always there, and eggs was always there. And, mm -hmm. Now, among your duties on board the ship, it uh, said you took care of watertight integrity. Could you explain that? Because there are 
people who are novices wouldn't know what that meant. Well, watertight integrity means uh, this room here, uh, depending upon how you're looking at it, I don't want any water to get out of here into the next room, or I don't want any water from the next room to get into here. Basically, keeping the ship afloat if it gets battle damage or you know, you run into something or somebody, another ship runs into you or something. So, you know, all your water, to, all your doors had, uh, there was essentially two types of doors, uh, what they call quick acting doors, which had a one handle that uh, put out what, what they refer to as dogs that are bars that go out, press up against the frame and, and push the door onto a gasket, or you had individual dogs, which were manual, that you, you had to go around the door, and there was a correct sequence of putting them, the, the quick acting doors basically all went out and went at one time. The manual doors, it was a correct sequence of going around and, and closing those. And um, then any place where wiring or pipes or any of that thing protruded through the bulkheads had seals around them and, and stuff and so our job was to go you know on a on a uh, PM schedule preventive maintenance schedule or whatever s sequence we would go around inspect all those penetrations and openings and, and everything uh, we would inspect the gaskets, replace them if they had to be on the doors and stuff. We'd do what they call a chalk test. We'd chalk the knife edge on the ceiling surface and then close the door, and make sure that the door sealed and everything. And then after that was all done, that was kind of an intermediate thing. And then I forget what the exact schedule was, but they they had a fitting where you actually get everybody as out of this room and stuff, and you would actually pressure the pressure room up and see see if you had a, what they call decay. If if you lost pressure, that meant you had a leak someplace. So now you had to go find where the leak was. But that that's basically watertight integrity, and it <laughs> took care of the scuttles and hatches and all that stuff. Now, were you luck were you lucky or unlucky to be designated the lead firefighter on board the ship. Well, that uh, that was my rate, damage controlman. So if you didn't want to, uh, again, everybody fought fires. You know, everybody was on, I, I shouldn't say everybody, but it didn't matter what rate you were, you could be assigned to a damage control party. Uh, and the damage controlmen were the lead persons on the damage control party. You know, we had more firefighting knowledge, we had uh, more uh, craft knowledge, let's put it that way, repairs, you know, and how you're going to make repairs and welding and, and that type of stuff. Uh, so that we took the lead as far as uh, if there was firefighting or something that had to be done on how to attack the fire and how you were going to attack it and, and all that that type of stuff. So if you didn't want to do firefighting, you didn't want to, you wanted to change rates. You wanted to <laughs> mm -hmm. But that didn't necessarily guarantee you weren't going to do firefighting because you could still be on a damage control. So they fire. have uh, instruction and in these things to keep you up to date and learn new things? Or? Right. We actually used to go through the regular Navy firefighting school at San Diego, what they called the fleet fleet training. We would go down there and, and go through the same same firefighting school. How were the officers uh, and men on board the ships? Were they uh, good and bad or some outstanding person that st stands out in your memory? Well, we had, again, the Coast Guard Again, today, I think, and in, in, in back then was, um, 
like the units in Alaska, the, the light stations were four men, mm -hmm. you know, and that probably was about the smallest unit you could get on, but uh, about the largest unit you could get on from a person standpoint or personnel standpoint was either Cape May Receiving Station or the boot camp or Alameda. The, uh, the ship that I was on was one of the next larger duty stations. We had, I think it was 145 total crew. Uh, the officers, I, f I don't remember exactly how many officers, but probably around 20 officers or so. And um, it's like everything else. You got good, good, bad, and, and different, but generally most of the most of the, the, the enlisted personnel were all very good guys and the officers for, I mean, every now and then you had a one, but typically the officers were all very, very laid back, relaxed. But as I said, the, 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 they only had 38,000 people, you know, and, and in their selection process, they, they were pretty uh, select in who they brought in, you know, it, you know, like, you know, when I went in and there was two guys, myself mm -hmm. and one other guy that went from Albany for the whole month of October. Mm -hmm. So, uh, they... How many tried out, do you know? Oh, I have no idea. Mm -hmm. No idea. But they, uh, you know, they gave you tests and stuff. Mm -hmm. down at the recruiting center and mm -hmm. uh, so they were they so most of the guys were Sharp. pretty good guys and mm -hmm. the officers uh, were uh, all very good uh, like the 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 Gresham that I was on had a full captain as the as the commanding officer you know that Roughly about the size of a even smaller than a destroyer in the Navy, they wouldn't be a full captain. Mm -hmm. um, so whenever we went into like San Diego or whatever, we got choice berthing spots and stuff because we had a full captain. <laughs> <laughs> Rank has its yeah, we were the closest ones to the dock. You know? <laughs> you know? Now you'd mentioned that when you had. Uh, Time off in Alaska, you'd go hunting and fishing. Um, yeah, we were there used any to. Exciting things you encountered. Oh, well, the fishing was great. I mean, we used to catch, you know, king salmon and halibut and all that stuff. But uh, would you cook them out there, or would you bring them back and share them on the ship? Or no, we. A lot of times we just let them go, and you mm -hmm. know, if we were on a lighthouse or whatever, a lot of, yeah, we would cook some of them and stuff. But we really had no Facility. no means to be able to bring them any place else mm -hmm. or keep them for a long time. Mm -hmm. The one time, or one time, I we were going out to I think it was Cape St. Elias. I forget where it was now, but I think that's where it was out, out in the Gulf of Alaska, and they had. Uh, I think it was the Coast Guard Cutter Sorrel tied up in Cordova, which is just a little ways from Valdez now, but back then there wasn't any. And uh, We were going on that for transportation out to the lighthouse. And, uh, I forget how many there was. There was three or four of us, but anyway, the, the cook said, oh, you know, for the guests we're going to have King Crab that night, you know, and he went over, you know, the crab fishing boats tied up St. Pierre just on the other side. He went over to the crab fishing boats and got some really mm -hmm. nice cream King Crab and cooked up for that night, you know. Mm -hmm. So Do I, I don't think they catch them that big anymore up there. You know? <laughs> Probably not. Do you see a lot of eagles and all up there then? Or weren't you in the Yeah, game? no, they, I, I, I remember seeing a couple, but didn't really, you know, you used to see whales a lot, a lot of whales, mm. Mm. stuff. I did, uh, I, 
we went to um, trying to think of the name of the uh, uh, Loran station that that's right outside or was right outside of uh, Sitka, Alaska, which was the old Russian capital, mm -hmm. and that right. that was interesting because it was all the the, the dome, the so church, neat. you know, the Greek Orthodox church with mm -hmm. domes and stuff. And, hmm. And I seen some pictures, uh, like on History Channel or something here later, that pretty much looks the same, except looks like there's more people there and stuff now mm -hmm. than there was back then. You know? mm. Going back to the days of uh, when you went to basic training, was it a shock? What was the pay like, if you can remember that? And what kind of procedure did you go through uh, from, from getting your hair, your hair shorn? Uh. Well, you went through the, you know, where you come in, you know, you get off the bus and somebody's hollering, you know, and, and they keep hollering for quite a while, you know, but, uh, yeah, you go through where you, you know, you get rid of the clothes that you got on and anything you brought is gone and you get fitted for your new shoes and boots and pants and shirts and get your hair cut and all that stuff uh, and you get assigned to a uh, back then if I remember right they you know I forget how many came in uh, but each individual company was 50 I think 50 or 55 something like that uh, people and you know they they started them at certain sequences so you know the, the first day or two you kind of were getting a physical and getting your clothes and all that stuff and and then they they assigned you to, to uh, recruit companies mine was Romeo 55 I think not sure about that but um, in then you, you got assigned a, a uh, company commander, um, instructor, or whatever, and he was your, usually him, they was the company commander and an assistant company commander, or whatever, which, um, and they were your motivators for the rest of the duration, let's put it that way. I mean, they didn't, they, you know, you used to go to, to classes and stuff where they taught you seamanship and semaphore and, and um, Morse code and all that stuff. Uh, you know, they they didn't do, the company commander and the assistant company commander didn't do all that. I mean, there was other instructors that did that. They just made sure you were there on time and you shined your shoes and made the bed the right way and folded your uniforms the right way and all that stuff. So. Was the commander a chief petty officer or a lower ranking? No, the, my company commander was uh, a chief bosun mate, Chief Suchak was his name. He, he was a good guy. He was a very down to earth and mm. stuff, you know, he was kind of, you know, I'm not sure uh, how uh, how to put it, but he he was a very very good guy. He treated everybody the same. Didn't matter, you know, uh, who you were, or how how smart or not so mm -hmm. smart or whatever, you know. That he he treated everybody the same. He was a good guy. How was the pay handled on there? Did you get paid once a month, every other, every two weeks, or how was that handled? If I remember we got paid once a month. When you was in boot camp, you really didn't get paid. Uh, you got, you know, you, you could get stuff out of the PX and stuff. They just signed you know, for it and they signed deducted for it, it. Right, and they deducted it. Uh, <clears throat> they didn't, when you were in boot camp until you got to the point which was, 
I don't know, like two months or two and a half months or whatever before you got your first Liberty Pass. Mm -hmm. uh, and then when you got that, if I remember right, they only gave you a certain amount of money. They, you know, and then when you got out of boot camp, then they gave you your money. Uh, and when you were going to get transferred to wherever you were going, then they gave you your money. And yeah, we were paid, I'm, I'm pretty sure it was every month. I don't think it was every two weeks. I'm almost positive it was every month. And it, it wasn't a lot of money. Yeah, now <laughs> Not when, in today's standards, you know. Now, where, uh, once you finished up in Alaska, where did you go from there? Uh, West Coast, San Francisco. And then from there, how long were you in that area? Well, I was 22 months in Alaska for us boot camp. I was there a year and a half or so, roughly. Oh, and then what, what kind of duty did you have down there? Uh, I was on board the ship right. there. I was on the on the ocean station vessel there. And then were, was that your last place you were? Right. I, I, I got discharged from Alameda. Okay. And then where did you go to after that? Did you come back to your hometown area or...? No, I stayed in uh, I stayed in California. I worked for a telephone company for a very short period of time, and then I signed on to U.S. Coast and Geodetic Survey Oceanographic Research Ship as an engineer. And uh, on that, I besides operate, you know, I, I operated the one engine room, but I also did basically what I was doing in the Coast Guard. I mean, I did welding and pipe fitting and machinist work and because we used to make a lot of gadgets and gadgets for the oceanographers and stuff. So then the, uh, your experience in the Coast Guard has helped you in your lifetime career. Oh yeah, definitely. Yes. And then uh, when you were done there, you Tell us about how the Navy has helped you. And I mean the Coast Guard. Coast, Coast Guard, Guard, I meant, excuse well, me. Well, from, I, I signed on to the, the Coast, I, I worked for a telephone company for like three months mm -hmm. and decided I didn't really like that. And as we would go in and out, when I was in the Coast Guard, as we would go in and out, I'd always seen this other ship that kind of looked just like ours up, tied up in Oakland there. And somebody had told me what it was at the time and so... I went down one day and talked to the chief engineer to see whether they were hiring anybody and what they were doing and he said, if you can be here in two weeks, we're going to Hawaii, you can go with us. So I said, hey, that sounds like a good deal. So, uh, so I signed on as an engineer as an, uh, at that time as an oiler and then I worked I had to take some Coast Guard exams and I worked up to uh, what they call junior engineer. Um, and I sailed uh, out of <clears throat> Oakland for, I guess, a year, or a little bit over a year. Uh, we went to Hawaii a number of times. We went, we were the first ship that verified the first global positioning satellite. Mm. Had computer on board that probably take up this room. Mm. Uh, and we went all up through Alaska again and down to Guam and uh, South Pacific and all over and back to San Francisco. Then from there uh, they transferred me back to Jacksonville Shipyard in Jacksonville, Florida, where a, a new oceanography ship was being built for him. Uh, 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 second assistant engineer, the chief engineer, and myself, we were the inse acceptance inspectors aboard that ship. So we spent like six months there where they ran the machinery and we just, we, we were the inspectors. And, uh, then I sailed on that for half a year or whatever and had gotten married and that wasn't a good job anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Makes the difference. How did you get back to this area here? Uh, we just moved back here and uh, 
because my wife Caroline's right from down in Glenmont. Still, we all had family here. I mean, I had family up on the hill and stuff, and uh, moved back here. I went to work for Board and Dairy for a little while in Menands. Again, doing pipe fitting, welding, mechanical work. Uh, and then I went from there, I worked for Otis Elevator for a little while and wound up working at GE Plastics for 33 mm -hmm. years uh, and mm -hmm. again doing mechanical work, piping. You know, I started out as piping and welding and mechanical stuff, wound up being an inspector there. Now tell us about your one of your favorite volunteer activities uh, down at the Port of Albany. Yeah, I, I volunteer on the Slater. What is the Slater? Slater is a World War II destroyer escort. So last one in the United States anyway that is floating uh, in near to its original configuration. It was uh, you know, built by Tampa Shipyard in uh, Tampa during the war. It was uh, uh, made, I think, six trips across the Atlantic, was being retrofitted for the Pacific Theater, and then the war was over. They laid it up under the Truman Lund lease. It, it wound up going to the Greek Navy. The Greeks sailed it for I don't know, 51, 52, somewhere is in there until 1990. Then they laid it up. The Destroyer Escort Association bought it, uh, brought it back to the United States. Uh, it was in New York City for a couple of years, and it got moved up here to Albany. I'm not sure how all that happened. Um, and I volunteer restoration, basically maintenance on it. Mm -hmm. So are there any other organizations you've been in as a result of your Coast Guard? No, not really. Any reunions you've attended? Keep up correspondence with the... No, uh, I used to keep uh, in touch with a, a buddy or a friend that lived in Colorado, but we kind of lost touch there. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, I haven't really gotten back in touch with him. A correction on that. Doug, what did, was the name of the vessel? Coast Guard Cutter Gresham. The Gresham, W387, and was 311 feet in length. These are some patches from Doug's Coast Guard duty. One of them is from the 17th Coast Guard District in Alaska, that on the upper left above the frame. On the right hand side above the frame is the U.S. Coast Guard Ketchikan Alaska base patch. In the picture frame on the right the left hand side is the U.S. Coast Guard Air Detachment Annette Island Alaska. Then a, a shoulder marker Kate Sharif. Then the Aleutian Islands patch and Below it, closing out the picture frame on the bottom right hand corner is the U.S. Coast Guard Cutter Sorrel, Sorrel Sitka. Sitka, Alaska. Mm -hmm. 